so as you know, we're here for the four-year review of um, Dr. Erin Haramoto. Erin uh, comes to us uh, with degrees from many states. So first degree was at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Then she went to the University of Maine, where she received a master's degree in plant soil and environmental sciences. And then she got her PhD in horticulture off the road at Michigan State University. She joined us in 2014, so we're right on track here, as an assistant professor in lead science. She was hired with 65% research, 35% teaching, and 5% service appointment. And her advising committee has been myself, Ola, Mike, and Todd, most recently joined. So as you know, she's going to give us a seminar that highlights what she's achieved in her four years here. You all should have received her narrative statement, her TV, and her teaching portfolio. We'll take questions uh, based on the work that she put off to show us. And then the faculty will be asked to stay for a discussion of her progress. Uh, take it away, Erin. I didn't ask about uh, microphone options, so I'll try to stand close to here. Okay, so that everybody can hear me. I am prone to wandering, so if I wander, we can hook you up. No, it's okay. I'll, 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 I'll I won't wander. It's right here. No, I'll be good. I'll behave. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, Rebecca, for the introduction and for everybody for being here today. I know everybody's itching to get back out in the field um, after the rain this week. So a brief overview of the seminar today. I will give a personal introduction, some of which Rebecca has already covered. I'll provide some context for the research that I do here, uh, why it's important to in, uh, integrate weed management practices and how a lot of my research and cover crops fit in, fits into those practices, and then go into a little bit of detail on the types of research that I do by talking about some specific projects. So first off, I'll uh, try to cover some of the brief, uh, some of the personal information that Rebecca uh, didn't cover. So I did start in September of 2014. I do have a degree in horticulture from Michigan State University, where I researched the use of strip tillage and cover crops, and also fertilizer banding for vegetable production. So I worked mostly with cabbage and sweet corn, and the types of things that I measured included weed emergence, uh, weed management in crops that don't have a lot of herbicide options, and then also some um, nutrient loss and uh, profitability um, cha uh, chapters in my dissertation as well. And that was really just before I started here, like literally six weeks before I started here, I defended. So as context for my CV, uh, my publications list, I was at Mount Holyoke College prior to that, uh, where I was in a teaching position. I was a technician for a USDA ARS unit in Urbana-Champaign, where I worked with uh, Dr. Adam Davis on various weed ecology and management projects in corn and soybeans. I do have my master's from the University of Maine, where again, I worked with vegetables, uh, cover crops for weed management. And then I do have two publications on my CV that are from a technician position long, long ago uh, at the University of Maryland, where I worked with phytoplankton blooms. And so my distribution of effort has shifted a little bit from, my, uh, from when I started. This table is in my CV. So the first year DOE is a reflection of the fact that I started by teaching only one course in that year. And so I've added a course every year since then. And so it's really this, um, this most recent year. Oh, this is difficult. This most recent year that's most reflective of my, my distribution of effort. And we did add service appointments in this most recent year. So I currently teach three courses for nine credit hours. Uh, this table is also in my CV and it shows the total funds that I've been awarded to support my research since my appointment. Can everybody hear me if I stand back here? Okay. So I have been successful in receiving funding from a variety of different sources. So nationally competitive funds like from USDA AFRI programs, regionally competitive, so I have a share grant with Krista Jacobson in horticulture, uh, state competitive funds like the soybean board, uh, industry funding, as well as some funds from the departmental and college levels. So I do collaborate with colleagues both in this department, uh, different departments across campus, and then also with a number of colleagues throughout the region and across the, the nation too. Uh, lastly, or almost lastly, uh, my publication record. This table is also, or this figure is also in my CV and shows the number of citations for my relevant publications, so excluding those two from phytoplankton work um, in the late 90s. 
So these are, again, for the 13 relevant publications, so that are either published or in press. I also have two more that are currently in revision. So in terms of ones that result from my Kentucky work, I have one that's currently in press, one that's in revision, and two that I consider to be in immediate preparation. So these are ones that will be coming out in the next month or so. So one of these I'll be talking about today. The other one is a publication that my graduate student, Tori Stanton, is working on getting ready to submit. She'll be defending in just less than three weeks. And then we also have a lot more in the pipeline. So we're wrapping up data collection on a number of projects this year. So I think we all know what I will be doing this fall and winter and next spring, uh, publishing the, those results. So lastly, to wrap up this section, uh, my teaching, I currently teach three courses, integrated weed management, which is a four credit course that meets in the spring. I've taught that for four years now. I also lead a graduate section of this course as a PLS 594. <coughs> so students take, our, take the lab and lecture of this course, and then we also do an additional journal club. So they get 500 level, 500 credit, 500 level credit for doing that additional journal club. I teach the capstone topics in plant and soil sciences for uh, seniors that are in the crops and livestock option of the HPLS major, and then also in the modern agronomic crop production major. And I've taught that for three years now, and then lastly, I teach PLS 531, the field school in crop pest management. And I've done that for three years, and I'm currently teaching that too. So this course meets uh, uh, in the, at Spindletop in May and August for field sessions, and then we have a classroom portion in the fall semester as well. In terms of advising, I advise three master's students, uh, Tori Stanton, who's finishing this summer, Austin Sherman, who will finish this winter, and Ryan Collins, who's brand new. I co-advise uh, Cynthia with, with Monsi. Uh, so she, she's the 0.5 in there, sorry, Cynthia. <laughs> and then um, I also, this past spring, advised an undergraduate Shelgren Fellow, McKaylee Kofer, who is in the ABMT program. So McKaylee will be coming back to do some research with us this fall. And then I'm currently advising also an undergraduate intern, uh, Gustavo Silva, who's a Western Kentucky <laughs> student through the UKREC Research and Extension Experience Internship Program. And that's a new program for those of you that are not familiar with that, funded by a USDA uh, grant. Okay, so moving on from this uh, personal introduction, again, a lot of details on that, especially in my teaching program can be found in my CV and my narrative statement and my teaching portfolio too. And we'll be happy to answer more questions about that that you might have. Uh, but to move on, to set the context for my research, because I think that's mostly what we're here to talk about today. So why is it important that we do this integrated weed management research? And why does my program focus so heavily on the use of cover crops? Well, this picture kind of sums up the need for this integrated weed management research. So this photo is from Trade County in Western Kentucky in the fall of 2015. This is from a extensive tour that Matthew and I took of some fields that have been overrun with resistant weeds. And so you can see some soybeans in this photo, and you can also see a number of weeds in this photo too. And so these are amaranth weeds, combination of common water hemp, and, uh, tall water hemp, excuse me, and palmer amaranth. So what happened in this field? Well, likely this grower applied herbicides to these soybeans that used to take care of these amaranth weeds and didn't get control out of those herbicides anymore. And so that's the textbook definition of resistance. So herbicide used to control the weed, doesn't control the weed anymore. So whether or not these weeds were resistant when they were dispersed into this field, these weeds are not native to this area, or whether resistance evolved in this field uh, is one question we can ask, but that's kind of a moot point for this grower. Um, they need to know what they can do about this problem because all of these weeds are producing mature seed at this point, and so this is gonna be a problem for them for years to come. So they can try to spray additional types of herbicides. Um, once they didn't apply to this year, they can rotate to another crop that has different herbicide options. But we're starting to see this problem too. So this uh, weed's resistant to multiple kinds of herbicides, multiple sites of action within one population of the species. So applying new types of products is often becoming less effective because of this problem. So this figure is a compilation uh, by Dr. Ian Heap. So if you're interested in this resistance problem, you can go to this website and get all sorts of data on the numbers of resistant species and populations that we have. So it shows over time the number of species that are exhibiting this multiple resistance. 
And so what, what, what multiple resistance is, is weeds that are resistant to not just um, one site of action, but multiple sites of action. And a site of action is where specifically within the plant the herbicide is working. So for glyphosate, for example, glyphosate targets the EPSP synthase, so it's an enzyme involved in producing uh, aromatic amino acids. ALS synthase, acetolactase synthase inhibitor enzymes work on acetolactase synthase, which is an enzyme involved in forming branch chain amino acids. So those are specific sites of actions of herbicides. So we have a number of weeds that are resistant to two different sites of actions, and often when that happens, we lose entire classes of herbicides to control those weeds. So the palmer and the water hemp that you saw in that previous photo in Kentucky, we at least have populations of palmer amaranth that are resistant to three different uh, sites of action, maybe even four. So growers are rapidly losing herbicide options to control weeds within any given crop. So we need alternatives to be managing these weeds. And so cover crops can really contribute to these integrated weed management programs. And one way that they can do that in brief, in brief is by reducing the density of weeds. And I'll, walk, I'll show a conceptual model of how they do this, but for now just note that by reducing weed density, we have fewer weeds that the herbicide needs to kill. In addition, uh, this just becomes a number game, numbers game. So if we're looking to forestall the evolution of additional resistance, if one in 10 million weeds has a chance mutation that confers resistance to an herbicide, and we have 10 million weeds in a 100 acre field, say, and we're using cover crops, we reduce that weed density to only 100,000 weeds or 10,000 weeds, then we have a lower chance that the resistant allele is out there in that field in any given year. So another way that cover crops can contribute to these integrated weed management programs is just by using resources and reducing the growth of weeds. So, Improve, uh, keeping these weeds small and easier to kill, lengthening the windows that we have to apply these um, post-emergence herbicides and increasing their efficacy. So I promised a conceptual model. This really appeals to my uh, teaching, uh, my teaching side of my brain. So how can these small grain cover crops that we use help to manage these weeds? So in our full season corn and soybean rotations and in our tobacco cropping systems too, we use cover crops over the winter. So we plant them in the fall after we harvest our cash crops. They grow throughout the winter and we terminate them the following spring prior to planting our next cash crop. So whether they are actively growing, like you see here, or after we've terminated them and planted our cash crop, whether they are residues on the soil surface in our no-till cropping systems, these cover crops can have a large influence on the soil environment. So they are influencing factors like light reaching the soil surface. So not just the amount of light, but also the quality of light, so the spectrum. Uh, soil moisture, soil nitrogen status, the temperature of the soil. So not just the maximum temperature, but also the amplitude of fluctuations between day and night. And then some cover crops are also releasing allelic chemicals as well. So a lot of these factors then, in the soil that are affected by both living cover crops and cover crop residues affect a lot of the processes that control plant um, germination and growth. So not seed dormancy, seed germination, seedling emergence, and then also plant growth and mature plant reproduction. So the net effect then of these cover crops, again, while they're either while they're growing or as residues, it's hard to use is often to suppress seed germination, reduce seedling emergence, whether this is through physical impedance of a mulch layer, encouraging diseases through increased moisture in the soil or through allelopathy, maybe encouraging seed loss, that's what this insect over here is supposed to represent, by having better habitat for seed predators or seed decay organisms. Um, and then also just using resources and reducing plant growth. And also maybe encouraging plant disease and uh, through allelopathy as well. So a lot of my projects focus on measuring some of these factors in the soil that can have an influence on a lot of these plant processes. And then we also measure typically the end result of a lot of these. So we're measuring weed density and biomass. We do this by species. 
so that we know what weed species are most impacted by these factors. And then, yes, because a lot of people care about what happens to the crop and yield, uh, we're looking at crop response and yield as well. So cover crops can be part of integrated weed management and part of agroecosystems, but they're not like this magic bullet that's going to solve all of our problems. They have a lot of advantages, but they have a lot of disadvantages as well. So they have advantages for the soil. Um, they can, because they're covering the soil oops, over this winter period, um, they can be helping to control erosion, capturing ex excess nutrients, adding nutrients if we're using legumes. The additions of organic matter, especially over time, can have all sorts of impacts on the soil, including increasing water holding capacity, um, alleviating minor compaction uh, through the effects of the roots, and then also clearly weed management advantages too. But there can be disadvantages as well. So if spring is wet and cover crops can't be terminated in time, they can go from being manageable to completely unmanageable in terms of the amount of residue that's produced. Growers can have issues planting through that residue, leading to reduced stands. They take time and money to establish them in the fall and to terminate them in the spring. There's often increased risk from using cover crops. Um, they, in dry springs, they use additional moisture. Uh, depending on the type you're using, can lead to nitrogen immobilization, which can be an issue if you're planting corn into them. And then we're seeing increased incidence, especially in our no-till systems, of slugs and voles, and we can have seedling diseases as well in our crops, even with our crop protection on the seeds. So in addition to researching how cover crops influence all the weed dynamics, a lot of my research projects are focused in on this balance. Uh, so this balance here. So how can we get the weed management advantages? How much residue do we need? How can we target better cover crop planting and, and termination practices? so that we're avoiding some of these disadvantages on this side of the balance. Okay, so after that introduction to cover cropping, the first research project that I would like to talk about is actually focused more on weed biology than on cover cropping. Don't worry, we'll get there. But really to manage weeds with cover crops, we need to know more about when weeds emerge and a little bit more about their biology. So this first project I'm gonna talk about is really focused in on this aspect. And so the project of this, the title of this project is called uh, Integrated Management Techniques to Combat Potential Shifts in Horseweed, or as we call it here, <coughs> Mare's Tail Emergence. And this project is uh, funded by uh, the USDA AFRI Crop Protection and Pest Management Program. I'm the lead PI on this project. It's collaborative with uh, other PIs at Southern Illinois University, the University of Missouri, and Kansas State, Missouri. Kansas State University. Sorry, Anita. Um, and so this, uh, we were able to leverage a soybean board grant uh, that we have with similar goals and objectives to get this larger federal project going. And so the overall goal is to learn more about mare's tail biology to better inform the management of this weed. And some, some, some specific objectives are to better understand variability in the emergence time of this weed and its growth patterns, to be able to develop predictive models of its emergence, and then develop management options uh, using that are integrated. So using cover crops, herbicides, and soil disturbance as well. So why are we focused in on this particular species, mare's tail or horseweed, Canisa canadensis is a scientific name. So it has a very small seed, which is actually an akene. Uh, it's wind dispersed. You can see this, the akene over here in this photo on the right with the pappus on it. Uh, because it's so small, it emerges right from the soil surface, so it actually can't withstand any burial at all. So it's a huge problem in our no-till cropping systems. And then because it is, it's pretty ubiquitous, not just in cropping systems, but in natural areas too, roadsides, other disturbed areas, uh, any grower that is actually able to successfully eradicate it is under constant threat of reinvasion of this weed. It can cause pretty large yield losses in corn, but especially in soybeans as well. And then there is so the herbicide resistance is pretty widespread. So this was the, one of the first agronomic weeds to have reported glyphosate resistance uh, just about five years after the widespread introduction of Roundup Ready crops. Uh, there's, so we have widespread glyphosate resistance in Kentucky. There's also resistance to a number of other sites of action as well. And then there's also just some tolerance to herbicides that normally control this weed as the weed grows. So it's really important to control these individuals when they're small before they get too big. 
So because of this fact, it's really important to control it soon after it emerges, when it's small. But you'll note yet that I haven't told you whether it's a winter or summer annual weed. Well, we can't really classify it as that in Kentucky because it can emerge in the fall and it can emerge in the spring or it can emerge in the spring. It has really complex emergence patterns. Uh, regardless of when it emerges though, it forms a rosette. That rosette bolts in the early, late spring, early summer. It flowers and then it produces seed in the late summer and you see uh, the reproductive structures above a soybean crop here in this photo. <coughs> so getting a better handle on these emergence patterns is going to be really important for developing better management practices for this, this weed. So when does it emerge? Um, like I said, it depends where you are. So in, in northern states and southern Ontario, it, it emerges mostly in the late summer and early fall. But the further south you go, we get more spring emergence. And a, a study in Tennessee conducted by um, one of Tom Bueller's students and Larry Steckel's students, uh, in three of five site years, the majority of that emergence was in the spring. So we know from other studies that um, environmental factors instead of genetic factors seem to control the emergence time. And this came from a common garden experiment across the state of Missouri. So seeds uh, from populations across Missouri on a north-south gradient uh, emerged all at the same time when they were planted in one location. So that does suggest an environmental control, not a genetic control. And then if we are gonna be thinking about environmental controls on emergence rather than genetic controls, what are these potential environmental controls? So other studies have also showed us that that different species can be, the emergence of them can be best predicted by either air temperature, soil temperature, or a combination of soil temperature and soil moisture. And this is dependent on the species. And we really suspect that mare's tail is going to be, um, best, emergence of mare's tail will be best predicted by the, this combination. And I'll show you some evidence why that is. This photo over here shows, um, Mare's tail seedlings, they are about two millimeters across at their widest point, very small, lots of fun to count. Uh, so again, the critical needs for this project are to really understand the variability in that emergence time, better predict the emergence time of mare's tail, so that we can better inform our management practices. So we've done some preliminary work in support of the initial submission of this proposal to find out when mare's tail emerges in Kentucky. So we collected seeds from Lexington and Princeton. We planted them in Lexington in the fall of 2016 uh, and tracked their emergence on a weekly or twice per week basis. Uh, and then basically this year, uh, over 2016-17, most of our seeds emerged in the spring. We repeated this in over the, the year, uh, the fall of 2017 into the spring of 2018. So with the help of Jonathan Moore, who was a postdoc that was working with me and Rebecca, and then also Ryan Collins is now the graduate student that has the joy of working on this project. And we saw completely the opposite. So seeds that we planted in the fall of 2017 all emerged that fall, and none of them emerged the following spring. So what's the difference in these two years? One pretty, uh, uh, pretty, uh, the obvious difference is the amount of precipitation that we had in these falls. So here's the same figure showing emergence over time, uh, over that 2016-17 year, and we had a really dry fall in 2016. So we only had about three and a half centimeters of precipitation in October uh, and in November before the base temperature, before the soil temperature dropped below our base temperature for germination. Once the soil temperature started to warm up again and we got precipitation in the spring is when we started to see emergence happening again. The fall of 2017 was completely the opposite. Uh, we had one of those tropical storm events move through in early October. We had warm soil conditions uh, and lots of precipitation in that fall. So this potentially explains why we had such different emergence patterns in these two years. And then just looking observationally, looking around the state, it was last fall, 2017 was really, uh, we had a bumper crop of, of fall emerged mare's tail, I would say. 
So this is a farm uh, outside of E-Town, uh, and we had quite a bit in mid-November, quite a bit of mare's tail, uh, and these, these seedlings were two inches in diameter. This one, though, was my prize mare's tail from last fall, three inches in diameter. That was in, at Spindletop. So our observations here in Kentucky over the last two falls and springs were matched by those uh, from our collaborator in Kansas, uh, Dr. Anita Dilley and her graduate student, Joey Rains. So again, uh, dry fall in 2016, no fall emergence, rain started in the spring, all the seedlings emerged. Wet fall in the fall of 2017, uh, seeds that were planted emerged that fall, no additional emergence the following spring. So what are we doing with all of these data? Again, trying to better understand the variability and emergence time. We're gonna to try to build predictive models across all of our eight site years of data that we'll have. So that if we have this situation where we have a warm and wet fall and we're gonna have plants of this size going into November, we can provide management options for growers. We can encourage them to either plant cover crops if they're gonna be using cover crops or to get in there with an herbicide application. Because again, we know that these plants are easier to control when they're small. So that their fields the next year look like this rather than like this. And then again, we do have a management trial in support of this, making these decisions where we are examining different combinations of cover crops, fall and spring applied and or spring applied herbicides, and then combinations of cover crops with herbicides as well. So I'm going to shift gears now and talk about one of the trials that we're wrapping up uh, that's funded by the Soybean Board where that is a little bit more heavily focused on cover crops and the impacts on, on both winter annual and summer annual weeds uh, as mediated through impacts on the soil. So again, this is funded by the Soybean Board for the last two years with the overall goal of, uh, sorry, the title is Optimizing Winter Cover Crops for Weed Management in Soybeans. So the overall goal is to just improve our knowledge then of how these winter cover crops can suppress weeds both before soybeans and then also in a soybean crop too. So specifically, we're looking at how some, some planting factors influence uh, the cover crop's ability to suppress both our winter annual weeds and weeds in the soybean crop. And so the factors we're looking at include the cover crop species, so cereal rye or wheat. Wheat is a more common cover crop in this state, but in terms of weed suppression, cereal rye might be a better option. It grows, it has a lower growing um, base temperature for growth. Uh, it tends to cover, provide more ground cover, which can be important, again, if we're thinking about weeds that need light to germinate and using uh, resources. We're looking at planting rates, so 100 pounds per acre, 100 pounds of seed per acre is our recommended cover crop planting rate. But if we're looking at small grains that can tiller, do we actually need that much seed? 30 pounds of seed is a more common uh, planting rate for growers in this area. And then we looked at two different planting methods. So drilling the seed or broadcasting the seed. Drilling is much more, uh, ensures a better stand, especially in dry soil conditions because you're, you're actually drilling the seed into the soil and ensuring seed to soil contact. But you have to wait until the crop has been harvested to get the drill in, into the field. And then also if, if it's wet, like we had in the fall of 2017, you don't want to be drilling into a really wet soil. So broadcasting the seed has a little bit more flexibility in terms of the timing, but if it is going to be dry, uh, generally we don't recommend that practice because uh, the seed establishment, seedling establishment can be um, reduced. So briefly, some methods for this. We sow the cover crops in October after corn harvest. We take overhead photos like you see here on the right throughout the fall, winter, and spring to estimate percent ground cover produced and try to use this as an explanatory variable for how well the cover crop is suppressing winter annual weeds. We sample everything, the biomass prior to terminating the following April, separate into cover crop biomass, so our desirable plants, winter annual weed biomass, our undesirable plants, this is objective one. And then we also count um, early emerging summer annual weeds uh, that will be problematic in the soybeans. But most of the, uh, the years of the, we've done this experiment, the density of these has really been too low to really analyze. So I'm looking at some other ways that we can um, get some information out of this data set, but I won't be talking about that today. So um, doing field experiments is fun. We've done this for three years now. And these ex each iteration of this experiment basically takes a whole year. From planting the cover crop in October of one year to harvesting the soybeans in October of the following year. 
So it's a long time for weather to really mess things up. Or as I need to think about it, introducing variability into the results. So these photos um, highlight some of the differences that we've observed in our cover crop uh, stand early in the fall, and then also in the biomass production uh, in, in the following spring. <laughs> We're looking at uh, all the cereal rye drilled at the 100 pound uh, seeding rate. And so this is often, these, these are all conducted basically in the same field. Um, it's been on top, in fact, you can see the same barn in this, there it is. Uh, so this is often a result then of the weather conditions in these years. So 2015, 16, we had really dry conditions in the fall, although in the early fall, wetter later in that fall and winter, but a very warm and a very dry spring. So lower biomass production that spring. 2016, 17, very dry fall, very dry fall, but a mild winter, it was the winter that wasn't, and then a warm and wet spring. So cover crops that did successfully establish produced a lot of biomass that following spring. 2017, 18 was completely the opposite. So very wet fall, followed by, let's put this in quotes, a cold winter, it wasn't that bad. Uh, and then a relatively cold spring too, but we had again, limited biomass production in that year. So weather does play a large role in the types of experiments that we conduct out in the field, which can be fun and also a little irritating to analyze. So I'm gonna show data uh, in this slide, like I would present to a grower. And this is in support of our first objective, which is asking how have these, all of these factors influence the winter annual weed biomass, the, the weeds that we have before planting these soybeans. So generally, um, the more cover crop biomass we have at termination, the less winter annual weed biomass we have. And this is because those cover crops are competing with those winter annual weeds. So this figure that I'm gonna show has the biomass uh, on the y-axis here, I'm only showing the drilled cover crop treatments because drilling really increased the cover crop biomass, especially in some years. And then all of the treatments, the combination of the seeding rate, the species, and here are gonna be shown here on the X axis. And so I'm showing cover crop biomass first, and this is an order of increasing biomass. That's why the treatments aren't necessarily in order here. And then overlaying the amount of winter annual wheat biomass. And this is kind of a no-brainer. Again, these cover crops are competing with these winter annual weeds that are growing in these same plots, using light resources, using moisture, using nitrogen. So this is what we want to happen. And generally, the more cover crop biomass, the less winter annual weeds, with a couple of exceptions in here. Uh, so what gives you more cover crop biomass? Generally, again, it's drilling the treatments into the ground, drilling the seed into the ground, it's cere planting cereal rye instead of wheat, but interestingly for rye, uh, the seeding rate, if you're drilling the seed, doesn't seem to matter quite so much. So since one of the objectives of this trial was to look at the, how these factors influence the winter annual weeds, let's take a closer look at the weed biomass. So this is just, those, just the weed biomass now. And so to analyze these data, I analyze each year separately, again, because we have highly significant year by treatment effects, thanks to the weather over the fall and winter. And then I'm using single degree of freedom contrast to compare each individual um, factor. So the seeding rate, the species, sorry, the species, the seeding rate, and the planting method, holding the other two constant. So I'm gonna show a series of ANOVA tables uh, for those contrasts here. And so the first set is comparing the winter annual weed biomass in rye plots with the winter annual weed biomass in wheat plots. Across drilling the seed at, 100, at the high rate, broadcasting the seed at the high rate, et cetera, for the three separate years of the experiment. And so if you're gonna drill the seed into the ground at the high rate, uh, you have similar amounts of winter annual weed biomass uh, in, in rye and in wheat. That's what this tells us here. If you broadcast the seed though, at the high rate, uh, you have different amounts of winter annual weed biomass, depending if you're planting wheat or rye. And so that's shown in this figure here. So winter annual weed biomass on our y-axis here, the three years on our x, and we have more weeds in the wheat than we do in the rye if we're broadcasting that high seeding rate. If we're gonna drill the low rate of seed, we had differences between uh, wheat and rye in the two years of the experiment, 
and again, more weed biomass in wheat, a lot more weed biomass in wheat than we had in rye. So a seeding rate had generally few impacts on the, weed, the winter annual weed biomass in the plots uh, for all combinations of the species and the, and the planting method. And then planting method had an influence on the weed biomass, uh, in particular in one year of the trial. So 2016, 17. And if you remember, that was the year that we had the really dry fall. And so we kind of expected to see this because we know that broadcasting seed is less effective uh, in, in establishing plants when it's dry. So let's take a look at the amount of winter annual weeds in those plots. Uh, so bro uh, broadcast, the, the weeds in the broadcast treatments are shown in the orange and in drilled are shown in the blue. And so we did have a lot more weeds um, in plots that had broadcast seed than in plots that had drilled seed. Uh, across three of our four combinations of seeding rate and species in that year with the dry fall. So to highlight kind of what we were seeing in these plots using photographs, uh, this photo really effectively shows how that dry fall affected the establishment of the cover crops. So we're looking at the following spring now, the plants have had a chance to grow a little bit more, and we're looking at the 30 pound rate of, of rye seed. A uh, drill plot showed here on the left, and a broadcast plot shown on the right. And what I hope you can see is that we have a lot more green in this photo on the left than we do on the photo on the right. And so Monty and I have been collaborating on measuring the percent ground cover produced by the cover crops uh, through time using all of these photos that, that, that we took over the fall, winter, and spring. And so, in all of the drilled plots for this particular rate and species, at this time, 87% of the ground was covered, but less than half of the ground was covered when we broadcast the seed in this, in this particular year. So it really highlights the impact of um, planting method in this dry fall. As a comparison, the same treatments for the next year where we did have a mm -hmm. wet fall, better establishment of those broad that broadcast seed, um, no difference uh, in ground cover between those two planting methods for the same seeding rate of, of rye. And this figure shows, uh, compares the percent ground cover that we did observe in that year, 2016-17, uh, with that dry fall. So uh, we're looking at percent ground cover here on the y-axis through time on the x-axis, and then each panel is showing um, a combination of the, the species and planting rate, and I realize you probably can't read this text, but just note that, that all of the red lines are for drilled seed, all of the green lines are for broadcast seed. The red line is always above the green line, so it's, it's telling us that we have more ground cover wherever we're drilling the seed compared to broadcasting the seed in this year. So what does this mean from a weed management point of view? Well, these, these lines really start to diverge um, in the <laughs> early spring period in March and April. And that is exactly the time when we started to see mare's tail emerging uh, in, in, this, in this spring, uh, in 2017. We know that mare's tail seed needs light for germination. Uh, and we know that the seedlings, if, they do, if the seed does successfully germinate and seedlings emerge, the seedlings also need light um, to be able to establish and start growing. So anytime we can keep the ground covered with these cover crops, we might be able to successfully reduce the germination, emergence, and establishment of these weeds. So it really highlights the importance uh, if we're gonna have a dry fall of using that planting method. So implications of this part, uh, more cover crop biomass, again, less winter annual weed biomass. They're competing for light, moisture, nitrogen, other resources as well. So in general, for suppressing these weeds, that means planting rye instead of wheat, the seeding rate, ended up not being that important for this. And then weather and soil conditions really affected the success of broadcasting the seed. And we showed that in the, the year, the 2016-17 year. So all of these ground cover measurements that we took and are analyzing, we're hoping to be able to use these as input for modeling the impact of environment by management on ground cover, on ground percent ground cover. And by management here, I mean, growers making these planting decisions on what am I gonna plant, how am I gonna plant it, and how much seed do I need to buy. 
there's other things that we can do with this too in terms of the amount of nitrogen that's in the soil. The soil moisture status too are all going to impact the tillering of these cover crops as well. So this has implications not just for weed management but also for erosion control and so it could potentially contribute to our predictive tools for mare's tail emergence. So I'm not done with this trial yet. We did have a second objective which was to look at weeds in the soybean crop as well. So just in brief um, we terminate these cover crops in mid to late April. We plant soybeans into them a month later. We spray an herbicide at the time of soybean planting to kill any emerged weeds. And then we go back and we count weeds at a couple of points in the soybean growing season. And I'm gonna show just data quickly on how the cover crop residues, because we've killed the cover crop now, are affecting the weeds in the soybean crop. And we also do, measure the soybeans themselves because we are interested in knowing how cover crops influence the soybean. I mean somebody is, right? I guess the soybean board is. They're doing this research. So um, after termination, we're looking at how the residues, so we're present as a mulch on the soil surface because we're doing this in no-till, reduce weed density in the soybean crop. So we're counting weeds for this figure seven to ten days after soybean planting. So these are weeds that are emerging with the soybeans are going to be competing with the, with the young soybean plants for resources. So all of our treatments are on the x-axis here. Here's our no cover crop control and then all of the cover crop treatments over here to the right of that. I was able to pool all of the data for three years now because we didn't have any significant year by treatment interactions. And then I, I used single degree of freedom contrast to compare each individual treatment to the control. And so each cover crop treatment, anytime we had some residue in the, in the field, we were reducing the density of these weeds that are emerging with the soybeans uh, by 55 to 75% depending on the treatment. So we go back and we count these weeds again, just prior to when we do our post-emergence herbicide application. And that is shown in this figure here. So these are weeds that we have to terminate with, we have to effectively terminate with that herbicide application. So same uh, general outline for this figure, but now we're looking at weed density prior to that post-emergence herbicide application. Again, our no cover crop control, and then all of our, our um, cover crop treatments to the right of that. And at this point, Again, so also using single degree of freedom contrast to compare with the control. At this point, only the rye treatments are significantly reducing the density of weeds at this time. The wheat treatments are not. The wheat treatments are reducing, though, by an average of about 25 to 30 percent. The rye treatments are reducing density by an average of 40 to 60 percent. So from a resistance management point of view, so we still need to go out and apply an herbicide, right? This is not enough weed, contr weed control to be able to skip this post-emergence application. We're not talking about a system where we have so much cover crop biomass that we are eliminating the need for an herbicide at all. But from a resistance management point of view, having fewer weeds in the field at the time that we have to apply this herbicide, we're having to kill fewer weeds with this herbicide again, reducing the chances that one of these is gonna be resistant to that herbicide. So what happened to the soybeans? Uh, 2016, we did not see any impact of the cover crops on the establishment of the soybean, the height, the development, or the yield. In 2017, though, we did. And I had a student visiting from Brazil, uh, Vinicius, who took a number of these measurements. Uh, Gustavo is continuing, continuing with these measurements this year. Uh, so these are measurements that Vinicius took in 2017. So looking at all of our treatments here on this x-axis of the figure, the cover crop biomass produced by these figures is shown in the blue bars that corresponds to this axis over here. So our high, high producing cover crop biomass treatments are on the right side here. And then he measures the, num the soybean stands, so basically the number of plants in these plots. And those are shown in these, these circles here. And so the more cover crop biomass we had, so in our drilled rye treatments, there was a reduction in the, the stand of the soybeans. So how many soybean plants were in the field? So part of this was a physical issue with planting. Part of this is because we had slugs come through the field um, as the soybeans were emerging. 
So Vinicius took a number of measurements throughout the, the season to try to look at how the plants were compensating for if and if they were compensating for this reduced stand. The upshot of all of that is that um, yield was similar in all of the plots. So again, here's the stand and the circles, and now we're looking at yield uh, in all of our treatments in these yellow bars. And yield was similar in all plots we yielded between 65 and 70 bushel soybean in this field, which for us is, uh, is not bad. And yield was also not affected by treatment in 2016. So we had pretty ideal growing conditions in 2017. Uh, so the plants were able to reduce, compensate for that reduced stand. Soybeans are pretty amazing plants. So Gustavo is, is repeating these measurements this year and um, we'll see what the weather does and whether the, the plants are able to compensate. I've not analyzed um, the stand from 2018 yet to know even if we had a reduction. So where are all of these data going? Well, they're going to inform cover crop planting decisions. So I always counsel growers when they ask me, what should I plant for a cover crop? And I say, well, if you want to suppress weeds, then data from this, this project suggests that planting rye is really a better option for you. And drilling the seed is especially important if, it's going to, if we're in a dry fall. On the other hand, uh, you really need to be able to deal with the cover crop residue. So we saw in, in one year that we had a reduced stand where we had more cover crop biomass. Now we saw that the, that sand was able to compensate and have similar yield, but this might not always be the case if we have a dry year. And then the other data that we're collecting and generating in this trial so is ground cover analysis. Can we use this to help predict the cover crop's ability to be able to suppress those winter annual weeds? And then other interesting data that's coming out of this trial, we think that we need to have these massive amounts of cover crop biomass to suppress these summer annual weeds. Well, we don't really need, we do to suppress if we want to completely replace an herbicide application. But if we're still going to be using herbicides, we don't need a whole, a whole lot of residue to provide some weed suppression. So from a resistance management point of view, reducing density by 50% is still important. That's the half of the weeds that are out there that we have to kill. And then with our community level data as well, we can explore what species are being suppressed more than others. I was gonna provide uh, more information on some of the other trials that we're doing, but I think in the interest of time, I will let you read about those in my CV and ask me if you have any questions about those. Uh, some of them involve cows. Mm -hmm. Some of them involve different soybean maturity groups to harvest earlier, to plant cover crops earlier, and some interesting economic trade-offs. Some of them involve um, also examining the economics of cover crop mixtures and monocultures. And then I actually spent a very long time trying to find the perfect picture and the perfect words to sum up the last four years. Um, I think the background of sunrise over spindle top is, is, is pretty adequate to describe the last four years. And then um, a very long list of people that uh, have, have kept a very large number of research pro projects, um, mostly on track, some of which are here in the room today and with, for which I am eternally, eternally grateful and thankful. And uh, it's been a real pleasure to work with all of these people over the last few years. Technicians at Spindletop, um, graduate students, interns and postdocs and undergraduates and faculty here and at other places. And then lastly, my mentoring committee. And what you can't see around, the, what this is around my neck is it's actually a a triathlon medal. So last fall I was out um, spraying plots after finishing a triathlon at Spindle Top Hall. Um, and those are not my work sunglasses, those are my <laughs> riding and running sunglasses. Uh, anyway, so that kind of sums up um, my life over the last four years. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you all have and uh, finally take a deep breath. So thank you. So when, when you talked about like <clears throat> controlling um, herbicide resistance, one thing that I noticed you didn't mention was keeping Rhodesia for you know, spray herbicide. Is that like not a thing for herbicides uh, like it is for insecticides or? Yeah, so that's, that's an interesting that's an interesting question. So the question was whether we have refugia where we do not spray herbicides 
as a resistance management tactic. And so that is a really hard sell for growers because of the way that seeds are produced and seeds are dispersed. Um, so there is, um, and then also the thresholds that we have for weeds, growers want 99 to 99.9 to 100% control in their fields. Um, and there is actually one of my former bosses is trying to promote that idea that you do want to have genetic diversity out there in your weed populations so that you are kind of diluting out the resistance alleles. So there's, there's a lot of um, interesting literature now that's showing that a lot of our herbicide resistance alleles have no fitness cost to them as well. And in fact, some of our resistant uh, biotypes are actually slightly more fit in a lot of ways that we measure fitness than susceptible um, biotypes. So it's an interesting concept and one that is definitely not taken off with growers. Um, it's debated in the literature every once in a while, but just like for every other pest, like pretty classic work showing that if you don't have refugia, then the resistance alleles will take over. Yeah, and then some, so some of our resistance alleles too are like pollen mediated, some of them are not. Um, it's, so it's, it's a little bit more complicated than it is for insects just because of the way that plants reproduce. But no, it's not something that's actively discussed outside of very, very small academic circles, I would say. Um, I mean, is that, I'm trying to think back to the re reports from the listening sessions. I don't think that was ever brought up as a viable option. No. Great. What's happening to the weed seeds? Are they rotting? Are they staying dormant? Are they germinating and dying under that residue? So the question is what's happening to weed seeds underneath the cover crop residue? Yeah, so that's uh, some, we actually have, um, we have a couple of projects looking at some seed decay, whether or not there is an enhanced seed, seed decay. So seeds can either be, they can germinate, they can decay, they can be eaten, they can just slowly die of old age, or they can be washed away, um, I guess, uh, too. So germination generally is the major lost pathway for seeds uh, in the, in the seed bank. Um, predation, there's been some work on predation, but results of seed predation studies tend to be really highly variable. And so we don't really know yet if we can manage whether or not even seed predation is enhanced underneath these residues. Because you kind of think like, oh, if you're a little crab and beetle or you're an ant or a cricket hanging out underneath this cover crop residue, you're protected from birds that want to eat you and it's shady, it's cooler, you have more moisture, you're not going to desiccate. Uh, but we don't have really strong evidence of that. Um, and then in terms of seed decay, there's limited evidence that decay pathways for seeds themselves is, is enhanced under cover crop residues too. But then there's a, this other school of thought that, well, just because you have an environment that's favorable for, for, fungal, for fungi doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to attack seeds because seeds seed coats are so resistant, uh, they're so, um, well, resistant to fungal decay. So why would you necessarily, just because you have more fungi doesn't mean that you're gonna have more seed decay in those environments. So there's kind of two schools of thoughts and we don't really have good evidence one way or the other. So we do measure seed decay um, in one of our trials. Uh, we measure it every other year. We have a seed, um, a seed decay study in one of in a trial that I'm doing with Krista in high tunnels. Those seeds are buried though, uh, six inches deep. So it's a slightly different. Well, it's a very different environment. Bruce, Aaron, Dr. I, Downey. Uh, that was a very nice talk, but I was rather surprised with your yield uh, graph, almost the last slide. Um, despite Dennis Eggley's constant reminders to the contrary, I, I expected you to have less yield with the control. That's not the case. So if I was a classical soybean grower and entrenched in modern agriculture where I'm spraying herbicide, what could you offer me as far as a reason to, to 
attempt come across. So you think that I would have lower yield? That's what that says, the yield per bushel, bushels per acre. Yeah, so you think I should have lower yield? Well, that's what I was hoping for, but. Uh, lower yield in which, in which in, scenario? In the control. In the control. Yeah. So because I have like less soil moisture, maybe? How about you didn't take the steps to apply a cover crop that would reduce the overall weed numbers that you had to attempt to kill, et cetera? So we are, this is, this, this is a, com I guess what I would, okay, well, the question is, why do I not have lower yields in the control where I... It's a classical, apply herbicides to the, to the crop, correct? Right, so maybe where I did have more weeds early on in the season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so let me flip back to weed density early on. So we did have more weeds in the control early on in the season. And this, this is an interesting question um, about like critical weed free periods and soybean. Um, so we are, these are soybeans in 30 inch rows. So we do have a little bit more um, space in between our soybean plants for these weeds to flourish, I guess could be one explanation. But generally, yeah, so when you have more weeds early on in the season, you should have, you should have lower yields, especially early on when those soybeans are competing during that critical weed-free period. And Bruce, I guess I don't have a really good explanation for this other than that just we're amazing farmers. Uh, no, but I think part of it is that we are controlling them. They're, so we do, have, um, we do have weeds out in the field early in the season. We are controlling them um, with herbicides at planting. So these are small weeds. These are small weeds that are emerging in those first couple of weeks. And then these that we're spraying off um, generally four weeks later. This year we had to spray them off way earlier because it's so hot and so wet this spring. Um, while the density is there, the biomass isn't always there. So these are sometimes small weeds that we're killing off. Um, and then I guess, even though we have uh, a difference in number, well, no, five to 25. Yeah. Aaron, yes. I was just wondering whether or not you could talk to the farmer who has resistant weeds in their field. And now you potentially might not have the type of control that you could exert at spindle top. Yeah, and we, we have seen that too. Um, where we've had this year in particular, um, because it, it was such a bumper year for weed growth, um, our post-emergence application got on a little bit later and our weeds were a little bit bigger when we tried to kill them off. Yeah, so we have some interesting other stories in here that we can mine to, um, for as cautionary tales for growers. Thank you. Yeah, Monsi. Um, it's actually interesting how when you show how the corn seeds, the noise phase, and the soil we are to the environment and when the we emerge, and also you show viability and cover crop cover uh, depending on environmental conditions. So I was wondering if um, what is the impression from the system that there's already some evidence of how under real-time minimal drought um, or that are more wet or with more environment, more productive conditions for fast cover, what is more competitive um, with versus cover crop? Yeah, that's a great question. So the question is, um, which one is going to be more competitive, weeds or cover crops, especially if resources are limiting, like moisture? So one of the one of um, the other trials that we're doing is um, that I'm doing with JD and one of my graduate students, Austin Sherman, is looking at, at a site that had a bunch of fall emerged mare's tail, so that came up early in the fall, so August, September, October, and then we planted a cover crop fairly late at the end of October. Um, so we were planting the, a rye cover crop into plots that already had established mare's tail in them. And so we did, in that case, um, let's see, that was the fall of 2016 when we started that trial. And so that was a dry fall. Um, and we were able to show that in that year, in that system, um, 
we saw a pretty dramatic decline in the density of mare's tail that was in plots with that planted cover crop. So without doing a really detailed study on competition and resource use dynamics and varying, uh, I haven't looked yet at like density of plants and biomass of plants like in individual plots to really know how all that pieces together. But as a whole, um, that particular study did show that um, the cover crop was able to reduce the density of that plant. So as a whole, I would suggest that the rye was more competitive for um, moisture than the mare's tail in that year, even though the mare's tail had a head start, if you will. It was already there when the rye was planted. Uh, yeah, but that's, you know, avenues for future research. Um, there's a million ways that that could go. So I don't think I actually mentioned it, but um, as part of this work, um, the Mare's Tail, one of the Mare's Tail projects that we're doing, the one that I talked about here, uh, we're measuring soil moisture. So not just relying on precipitation, but actual soil moisture measurements as part of those models. And we're, we're monitoring emergence uh, in the absence of, of residue cover. Um, so by repeating that trial in different cover crop scenarios too would be, would be good to do. Uh, anecdotally, we, hard, we usually hardly ever see mare's tail emerging when we have cover crops in the field. And that's something that um, we've seen and Jim Martin has documented as well with, in his work with wheat. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hon Yang. Uh, you talk about taking picture as part of the uh, experiment. In the field, how do you randomly choose spots to take pictures? So they're actually not random. Well, they're random at first, uh, and then we mark, we follow specific locations uh, throughout the season. So they're actually marked with, um, see if I can find them here. Uh, they're marked with these stakes, these orange, I don't know if you can see them anymore, but there are orange stakes in the corner here, uh, and then these signs that Matthew has made, so they're, they're marked, so we are, we are tracking the same location uh, within any given season throughout the whole season. So they're random at first, uh, but then not random for the rest of the season. I guess Dave left. So who are the back? Carlos. Harry, um, so you mentioned on the, uh, the, on the Tennessee trial, the Common Garden trial, there were no differences between uh, different locations in um, germination. However, in your trial, it seems that with the, with the locations from Kentucky, it seems that there might be a small difference. Uh, in 2016, I think it was. <clears throat> But there, there, there were no differences in 2017. So, um, did you, well, first, are those differences significant? And second, in the second year, where did you get the seed from? Did you collect the seed from your first trial, or you went back to the two locations and recollect seeds again? So, the question is whether uh, in, in the 16 17 year, whether these differences between the Lexington and Princeton seed are significant in terms of the timing of emergence, uh, and then whether the seed lots were the same or different seed lots. Is that right? Well, whether the, the second, uh, the second uh, seed lot was collected from the, the plants that were planted in, in, in by you in, in Lexington. Okay. Uh, so the the first question as to whether or not these um, these timings are significant or not, I honestly don't re don't remember. So I was looking at mostly at the season. So was it fall or was it spring? And I would classify these as both as both spring. But yeah, clearly the one in Princeton did emerge just a little bit earlier than the Lexington. Sorry, the Princeton seed lot did emerge just a little bit earlier than the Lexington seed lot. Uh, these were both planted in. Um, in Lexington. Um, and so in terms of the Tennessee trial too, they were looking mostly at seasons. They weren't looking at maybe a week or two earlier within a season. They were looking at fall versus spring, not maybe like early March versus mid-March. Um, so no, the seeds, the seeds for each trial were collected from native plants in Lexington and in Princeton in each fall. So not from um, plants that we had planted. 
Uh, yeah, so part of what we're, we're going to do too is to look, you know, calculate uh, T, T time to 50% emergence and all of these things from planting date. And you'll notice that I've also expressed uh, on the y axis as proportion of total seedlings emerged. We tried to always plant, so I actually, each year we, we had um, eight populations planted in each location. Um, and I'm only showing seed from Kentucky just to make things simpler. But we tried to plant only 200 seeds of each population, but you can imagine trying to count out seeds um, that are like this is kind of impossible. So we tried to do it by weight. Um, and then we had a lot of chaff in the seeds too. So it ended up being um, kind of difficult experimentally to manage. So we ended up, um, each population had slightly different seed numbers that went in, which is why I expressed it as uh, percent emerged instead of um, number of seeds. Okay, you all, let's give Aaron one more big hand.